Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Green Acres Baptist Church, for allowing me to come in and do, uh, for a moment, to fill this most important and urgent task, and that is to preach the word to God's people this morning. So, uh, I, I met a few of you this morning, um, got to know some of you through some longer conversations than others, uh, got to shake some hands, get some names see some new faces, and in one sense, we, we know each other, right? We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and uh, it's an incredibly special thing uh, to fill the pulpit of the church that my church prays for regularly. We pray for you guys by name regularly in Sunday morning services, asking and pleading for the Lord to pour out great revival amongst you and amongst our community in Athens, and we also know, as Jay said, we're partnered together, and our mission is the same. We have the same gospel, the same hope, the same Savior, and our hope is that the work that God does at Green Acres will spill over into Cleveland Road, and the work that God's doing there will spill over to here, and that the community of Athens, Clark County, will be impacted by the Word of God and by God's Spirit as He moves to revive hearts, to convict hearts, to convince human beings that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, in another sense, we don't know one another at all, do we? I met some folks. I know uh, that it's her birthday today. I know uh, that uh, one of your greeters is from a church called Cash Baptist Church. Uh, it sounded like on the outskirts of South Carolina. Got to know a few things about some of you, but in many ways, I don't know you at all. This, this reminds me of many years ago, we took my grandmother back to her hometown of Enterprise, Alabama, she had not been there for nearly 60 years, but it was some sort of an event at a church. Uh, I think it was the Methodist church where she was the member at some point in her life, and my dad said to her, he said, Mama, you probably know some of these folks around here, and, you know, it made sense, right? Some of these folks have probably been in this small town for many years, right? Probably some of the same folks, and probably thinking to ourselves, my dad and I, you know, she probably grew up with this one over here, they might mate you know, exchange names and realize they go back, you know, with uh, 70, 80 years of history. So she turns around very promptly to the person sitting at the table just behind her, and she says, who are you? And the person responds back with their name, and she turns back to us just as cold, dead serious as she can, and she says, well, I don't know you. So in many ways, we don't know each other this morning, right? But we're joined together. We're, we're blood-bought as believers trusting in Christ. Uh, we you and I will live together in the new heavens and the new earth forever. An interesting thought, right? We will live together, not, not in the same dwelling, right? There are many places the Lord is building for us, but we will forever be joined together as a family. So I say that by way of introduction, it's a special uh, place, uh, special opportunity for me to be here today. Uh, please be in prayer for the gentlemen that aren't here, uh, for uh, your pastor for Cameron and for the other men that are with him and uh, be in prayer for him always. Uh, he loves this church and he has a heart for you all and I've gotten to know him through some, uh, some cross uh, events through our church or our church is and uh, I'm happy for you guys that he serves you well as pastor and shepherd of this church along with Jay and others. And uh, Jay, thank you so much. He's been so welcoming all week long to me through text and things like that. Um, and I do want to say, Jay, that they sell a larger guitar, and uh, I, think, I think they call it a full-size guitar, but uh, no. So, all right. So this morning, I want us to go to a text. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to go to a text that is rich with language that identifies who we are as believers. Now, this passage in 1 Peter is written to an audience of mostly Gentile, that is, non-Jewish believers. And this passage uh, is uh, Peter writing to these believers to instruct them on how to live, how to relate to others, how to work. And here in these two verses, Peter tells them who they are. All right? So if you would, join me in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's read our passage together, and then let's pray together after reading. 1 Peter chapter 2, looking at verses 9 and 10. Peter writes, But you, reading from the New American Standard Bible, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you that indeed the one who comes to you and is washed in the blood has his sins forgiven and separated from us, and you choose to remember them no more. We thank you that in you we have boldness to approach your throne and find you, our Savior, there pleading for us. We thank you that you have given us your word that tells us who you are and who we are. Lord, would you give us eyes and ears to understand and a mind to comprehend and give us a will set on following what you call us to do as a church and as individuals. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want us to see how Peter directs the passage to us. To us. Believers, those who were not, are not Jewish Israelites. And he tells us who we are. Who we were. What we now have and what we are to do. So there's our outline for us there. Peter tells us who we are, who we were, what we now have, and what we are to do. Let's walk through this passage together. Peter tells us we have a history, a mission, and we have a future. First, let's look at who we are. Who we are. Look again at verse 9. He says, but you, but you. So in the the passage leading up to this, in chapter 1 all the way through chapter 2, up through verse 8, Peter is building a case that the, the people that he's writing to, the believers that he's writing to, have the privileges that are the fulfillment of what was promised to Old Testament Israel. To those who were ethnically God's people, marked by external characteristics, and also to have had devoted hearts, but God has done something where he's brought in those who were not ethnic Israel, and he's, Peter is writing to these folks and saying, these are the promises that are given to you. And we're going to look at several different passages of Scripture so that we can understand this fourfold description of who we are. First, we have to note that this passage is filled with references to you. You. In verse 9, he says, but you or a chosen race. And then a little later he says, that you may proclaim. And then he says, who has called you out of darkness. And then in verse 10 he continues, he says, for you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter is identifying a specific group and he's telling them, these are the characteristics of you. This is the description of you, who you are, believer in Christ, follower in Christ. Recently, I was uh, in my job. I work with quality assurance auditors every once in a while. That's not my task, but I manage a set of uh, services and responsibilities, and then an auditor will come in, and we'll go and look at uh, different uh, services that fall under my my purview. And so uh, there's kind of a... uh, I guess you'd say a a tactic when an auditor comes along with you, and this is uh, no offense to anyone who is an auditor, there's a special type of person that can look at things and really examine them and show you where you're weak, show you what you need to fix. But uh, the strategy for me when I work with an auditor is basically just kind of keep my mouth shut, right? Don't give him any more than than he needs to. I'm not hiding anything, but I'm certainly not going to offer up and, you know, expose any other weaknesses that we have uh, as a business or a company. So an auditor comes in, I'm kind of quiet, in this instance, just recently, he rode along with me in my car, and there began the stories that this man would tell, and he told me about a time when he went past a Toyota dealership, and he pulled in to check on some 
uh, price of a new vehicle, and they said, well, we'll give you 10000 more than you paid for your existing vehicle. So he sold that truck to them and got a brand new truck. Thought, wow. And then he told me the next time, two years later, he did the same thing he drove by, and they offered him $12,000 more, and there he drove off with an even better, larger Toyota truck. And then the third time, I'm scratching my head, I'm listening, right? And then the next day, he tells me a story of how he, with the company, bought another company, and they came in and they said, we're not going to give you this, and he asked for it. And they gave him the new car, and they gave him the bigger salary, and they gave him the, the greater role that he wanted, and, and greater and greater prominence. And I'm scratching my head thinking, this guy is the luckiest guy I've ever met. This guy has run into more fortune and told me about more incredible circumstances in, in two days of riding with him than I've experienced in my whole life. And what I realized was that every story was about him. It was all about him and the glory to him. And I almost think he wanted me to say, you are incredible. Your life is amazing. You have everything that you deserve and much more. It was all about him. In our passage today, we find a little bit of that you language, but it's not that the passage that Peter, he's not trying to make much of us. He's trying to say, this is who you are, and who you are makes much of God. We're going to find that in our passage today. So let's look at this fourfold description for just a moment here. He says, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Now, this is definitely Old Testament language, a chosen race. In the Old Testament, we find scripture after scripture, story after story, where God, through his own sovereignty, through his own independent dominion over all the earth, chooses to call someone undeserving from a place of being undeserving, and they receive great mercy. We have the example of Noah. We have the example of Abraham. We have the the example of Jacob. We have the example of Joseph. We go into other passages of Scripture, and we see Joshua and Caleb, and we find King David, and we find many throughout all of Scripture, even into the New Testament, where the Lord takes uh, the Apostle Paul before he's the Apostle Paul, and he changes this hardened uh, Christian hater, Christian killer, into a display of God's grace by converting this undeserving one into one who is a recipient of God's mercy. This idea of being chosen. Uh, This is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14 language. Flip over with me if you will. And There's no reason for us to to cringe uh, at passages like this. This this idea of chosen or elect is is the word in the Greek there. Uh, This idea is, is to magnify God and his superiority and for us as believers to be humbled in light of who he is and to see that despite how transcendent and great and beyond us beyond our comprehension that he is he has chosen to come to us individually and say tommy follow me sister edna follow me brother bill brother bob follow me jay you're mine Look at Ephesians chapter 1 with me in verse, let's read from verse uh, 3 and following. This is a long prayer from the Apostle Paul, but it illustrates this idea very well. Paul writes to the Ephesian church, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through jesus christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to the kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of time, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ. Things in the heaven and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of God his will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ 
should be to the praise of His glory. Wow. Wow. What a magnificent thought that God, before the foundation of the world, has set His affection upon His church and He has foreknown and called and predestined and saved and justified and glorified according to Romans chapter 8. And Paul or Peter writes to the church and he says, you are a chosen race. So that sounds like Israel language and Peter is saying, this church is now you. It's you. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Now let me pause for just a moment. I was a little uh, confused this morning because I got conflicting reports on what time uh, to finish preaching. So someone said 2.30, someone said 2. And so I'll finish somewhere, probably closer to 2. But no, um, let's continue on. So a royal priesthood. Uh, listen to the language from Isaiah chapter 61. Would you flip, flip over to the major prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament? I encourage you to read through Isaiah in your spare time this week if you don't have a reading plan and just marvel at the magnificent writing from the prophet Isaiah and his picture of who God is. But in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 6, the prophet writes, but you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast and speaking of the new Jerusalem the new people of God Isaiah writes from the mouth of the Lord that we we his people will be priests now that's a word that is foreign to us unless we came from some sort of a maybe Jewish or perhaps a Catholic background we don't think of ourselves as priests we have one high priest priest a chief high priest whose name is Jesus who Jay spoke about just a moment ago from the book of Hebrews whose blood pleads for us and whose sacrifice gives for us the once for all merit to stand before God the Father, before the throne above. But here, this role of being priests, this role of sharing in, uh, proclaiming the sacrifice of Jesus, both to one another as the body and to our neighbors and to the world, and being instruments of God and proclaiming that Jesus' blood is the only way to atone for sin. And Peter applies this title not to Old Testament Israel, but to us, to the church. He goes, apart, uh, goes along and he says also a holy nation. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, and Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, the people of God are described as a holy nation. That is, a nation devoted to God, a nation separate from the Canaanites, from the heathen, from those who would uh, sacrifice their children or who would uh, 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 mutilate their bodies uh, to appease gods. Rather, he says, they are set apart unto me from the things of the world and unto me, a holy nation. And then he says, people for God's own possession. There again in Exodus 19 and throughout Deuteronomy. And then also as we read there in Ephesians chapter 1, we are a people possessed by the Lord. That is, we are His possession. He holds us firmly in His grasp. We at times feel that we would let go, that we would turn away, that we would slip away, that our hearts are prone to wander and leave the God we love. But here we find that we are possessed, held by, firm in the grasp of God. Peter says that is a description of you, my people, the church, redeemed, purchased, distinct among the nations. Listen to this. Uh, this is from the reformer John Calvin who wrote a commentary on all of the Bible. He says these words. I, I think it's a beautiful uh, encapsulation, I guess you'd say, of, of verse 9. He says, there is further, as to these benefits, speaking of that fourfold description there, a contrast between us and the rest of mankind to be considered. 
And hence, it appears more fully how incomparable is God's goodness toward us. For he sanctifies us who are by nature polluted. He chose us when he could find nothing in us but filth and vileness. He makes his peculiar possession from worthless dregs. He confers the honor of the priesthood on the profane. He brings the vassals of Satan, of sin, and of death to the enjoyment of royal liberty. That's good stuff. But he goes on in this passage, and he says, so that, and so we have a purpose clause, don't we, there in verse 9, so that, or that you may proclaim. So this fourfold description outlines the basis or foundation from which we operate as believers. In other words, the realities that describe the church in the beginning of verse 9, these realities are the fountain from which the behaviors flow the end of verse 9. And in verses 11 and 12, and in so forth through chapter 2, if we were to read on further, we would see how Peter starts to address relationships among men, women, children, families, workplace, society. And Peter says, from this reality of you being a peculiar people for my possession, this is the fountainhead for your behavior in these other situations. And Peter says, remember who you are in verse 9a, and then he says, remember who you are were in verse 9b and 10. Who we were, second major point. It says, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Listen to the words again from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. If you've got a finger there, you can read it along with me or listen as I read it. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2. prophet writes, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be in your presence as with the gladness of harvest as man rejoices when they divide the spoil. The Lord has promised us a great light. He has called us out of darkness and into light. So who we were, we were lost in our sin and in darkness. Jesus, in the Gospels, the story is told of his great friend Lazarus. And Jesus, on his way to see Lazarus, finds out that Lazarus has died. And Lazarus' sisters plead with him, come, come, Come see our brother. And he realizes he's died. And the scripture says Jesus waited a day and then went. And Jesus arrives there. And that's where we have that famous verse that Jesus wept. And Jesus goes to the tomb where they had laid Lazarus. And what happens? You guys know. Jesus stands at the door. And he says, Lazarus, please. Lazarus. Please wake up. No, that's not in your translation, is it? If that's in your translation, leave that Bible behind in a garbage can. Jesus goes to his friend Lazarus, who is dead, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And the scripture says, and Lazarus rolled over and pulled the blanket over his head and said, I'm sleepy right? I know. Lazarus, Lazarus did what? He came forth. God, through divine power, made one who was dead alive. One who was in darkness. He brought him into life. In fact, Jesus, the light of the world, shone his light, the light of his life, into Lazarus. And Lazarus, who was dead, became alive again. And brothers and sisters, this is the reality of all who are in the church. Believers trusting in Christ today, you once were in darkness, but now you are in marvelous light. You have been transferred from death to life. That's the imagery here, Paul, or Peter says, don't forget who you were. 
The Spirit cries to the believer this morning who has returned to this darkness. And he says, what are you doing there? Why do you hide in the shadows? Why have you turned the light off? You don't belong there. It's not your home. I have called you into marvelous light. And for the believer, we hear that call. We hear that that our conscience is pricked by his spirit, and we stand and we move into light once again. Not having lost our salvation and regained it, but spiritually speaking, in our journey, having turned back, thinking that there's something satisfying still in the darkness. And this morning, God would say to you, he has transferred you from darkness into light. Don't return to the darkness. He continues on. He says, you. Here's what we have. He says in verse 10 now, for you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I want to read to you from Hosea. A wonderful, beautiful passage from Hosea. Chapter 2, verse 23. Just listen along. It says, And I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion And I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Friends, in Athens, Georgia today, I'll make an assumption that not many in here come from a Jewish family or Jewish history. Understand today that what God talked about through the prophet Hosea, more than 2,500 years ago, that he would bring in another people, he is telling us today as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are now his people and we have obtained mercy. And we who were once dead are now recipients of God's grace. Objects of mercy. Mercy being he has withheld the due penalty that we should receive for our sin. And he has poured it out on another. The man Jesus Christ, the God man. And Jesus Christ on the cross has borne the penalty, the just penalty for our sin that we as sinners deserve. And he has satisfied the wrath of God. What big, bold, and strange language that we sing in our songs that are reflective of glorious theological truths in Scripture, that we are made one with God, that we are made righteous, not because of our own doing and abilities, not because of foreseen merit and choices in ourselves, but rather through the mercy of God, He sets His affection on us, removes our penalty, puts it on the willing servant, Jesus Christ, and He crushes Him, and it pleased Him, and you and I stand in His righteousness as believers And he says, this one is righteous based on the merit and the worth of Jesus Christ. What we have, we once were not a people, now we are. A.T. Robertson, a great Greek scholar, discusses the language of 1 Peter chapter 2. And this is just kind of a paraphrase from the point that he makes. And he says, long we lived in darkness, belonging to this corrupt world, bound by our sinful state. But in a moment, we're transferred to light and we're given a name and an inheritance. The language here is that we were dead and laid there dead like Lazarus, but in an instant we heard the voice of God and came forth because what else could we do? We came forth and followed him. This is my favorite line from my favorite hymn in all of church history from what I've read and experienced in my 40-whatever years. Charles Wesley says it like this. He says, Long my imprisoned spirit lay Fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, my dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Brothers and sisters trusting in Christ today, understand you have been given life. You have been given 
light. You have a hope in Jesus Christ. We had not received mercy. Now we have received mercy. Fourth and finally, we see what we are to do. Let's return now to the second half of verse 9, and we'll finish up in this area. He says, Who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, or excuse me, uh, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you. It, it's not about you, but it's about what he's done in you, for you, and through you. There is an epidemic in our world today, people all around this globe dying for answers to life's most basic questions. In countries around our globe today, the Muslim women lie awake at night and wonder if God hears their prayers. The tribes of Eastern Africa look at their ancestors and they slaughter their neighbors because they have a corrupt sense of justice and they hold hatred in their hearts for their fellow man. The governments of countries ac across our globe believe that they're smart enough to control the price of goods, but in so doing, they starve some and they enslave others and they become rich themselves. On our own soil, we have a generation of people who are so confused about their feelings and so uncomfortable in their own skin that they convince themselves that their biological identity contradicts their gender identity. And so they go to schools, to social media, to politicians and medical professionals, and by mutilation, castration, or whatever means necessary, they receive some faint, temporary shadow of what they truly desire. Affirmation. Affirmation of their identity. You are the greatest, most devoted Muslim. Allah will bless you with paradise because of your strict devotion. You are the strongest, most intimidating tribe on the plains. All people fear you. You can take whatever you want, whoever you want, and do whatever you please. You are the greatest, richest, and most threatening country on planet Earth. Your wealth and your nuclear arsenal are rivaled by no other country. And you, young lady or young man, you're right. Your heart would never lead you astray. We'll call you whatever pronoun you want to be called, and we'll celebrate your journey to reveal your hidden identity. And you here this morning have your three and two or your four and two and a half, and you have your Buick, and you have your Cadillac, and you have your money in the bank, and you have your trust in politicians in this world, and you have your banner of a failed politician, and we say, this is our hope. Look at this world. And you say, that's not where my hope is. And I say, if it disappeared today, what would you feel? If those things went away in your life today, how would you be affected? Would you be in deep despair? Would you call your friends? Would you call your congressman? Would you quit your job? Would you take on a new job? Would you change churches? Would you change radio stations? Would you leave the TV on every hour of every day? God is saying to us, he has given us an identity. And he's saying he's given us that identity that we may have it, but that we may proclaim it. Church, this morning, do you understand that the Muslim across the world, or the one in the communist nation, or the lost tribe of Africa, or the confused neighbor and child here in Athens, Georgia, they don't need a better president. They don't need a better congressman. They need the gospel from you. They need the hope of Jesus Christ from your mouth, from your life. For you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession who once didn't have mercy, but you who once were dead now have mercy. And your hope and their hope is that this God, this identity can be theirs as well. Oh, church, those things aren't necessarily bad things, all of them, right? I'm not hammering on possessions. 
or, or our system of government here. I'm trying to get to the hope that you have. And if it's not God's mercy and your identity in Christ, it is misplaced. This morning, it's possible that you're stumbling in darkness and you have never, never been made alive. The Bible says that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it says also that the wages of sin is death. It says that all our righteousness is but filthy rags. If you're three years old, you're 103 years old. We come before God as sinners in need of his mercy. Scripture says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We who were dead like Lazarus in our sin. Christ died for us. He says in Romans chapter 10 that if you, this morning even, will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you too will be saved and you will join those of us who belong to a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for God's own possession. And you too will proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness. And you'll become a person who had not known mercy, but have now received mercy. I invite you this morning to cry out to God, if that describes you, and to ask him to save you from your sin. Jesus is the only way. Brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, are you proclaiming his excellent greatness? Does your life demonstrate it? Do the words of your mouth speak of it? And is your heart resting in that? Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that, Lord, you are so great and wonderful and in many ways so far beyond our comprehension, but yet you have demonstrated your love for us in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and you have come and taken on flesh and taken on sin that we might have life in you. I pray that you would be at work this morning at Green Acres Baptist Church and reviving our hearts or making someone who is dead alive today. Lord, may your word accomplish its purpose because we know it will. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.